Welcome everyone for high performance computing. Today we have lecture four on advanced MPI techniques. And this lecture builds on elements we had before in lecture two, lecture 2.1 that were both on MPI. Then we looked a little bit at the bigger picture, lecture three, um, to understand parallelization, um, basically approaches overall. And some of these we've taken up now, basically like things like domain decomposition, how we can realize this with the Cartesian communicator and MPI, just an example for interesting topics that we have here in the conceptual lecture today. But before we dive into the material of lecture four, let us review what we had in lecture three. And this was all about understanding parallelization, perhaps a little bit from a more conceptual idea. But then we also learned that this conceptual idea is loaded, especially if I have different times. We have iteratively to simulate maybe waves over the ocean or where we basically want to have some heat in the room. Um, there were different application examples that showed us um, in a way it sounds very nice, this parallelization idea and very easy, right? So the easy approach might be looking a little bit like here. You would say parallelization, okay, I want to have the maximum of an array with 16 elements. Obviously, you have four cores available. You just basically break this big problem, the 16 elements, into smaller problems, which would be four elements for each of the different four cores. Also very easy. So you think that's nice and shiny. Um, let's go forward. Everybody's computing the maximum of basically this part. And then I would come up with the global uh, magically and then have basically just to report the outcome of all of these four. So in one respect, it's true. My parallelization is in a way similar, like I just described. But what we also learned was there's always this kind of magic that doesn't come automatically. And this one was, for instance, last time we see Max Global, right? So someone also has to compute this. Right, even if it's maybe not the biggest computing, but this stands, of course, also for the whole idea of parallelization. There could be many more, let's say, elements in an array, a multidimensional array, a large domain of computing that you want to simulate, whatever it is. But you see, sometimes the assumption that every problem can be break into the same pieces is a little bit misleading because there would be one of these cores that also has to basically compute the idea of max global here. And this means then that this core has more to do and the other cores are already long finished. And we have basically talked last time that this is actually alluding to a phenomena uh, that we call basically load imbalance. That means core one might be still busy doing its own work share as the so-called master, however, being also responsible uh, to collect everything from the workers which is one item to work on. After the collection, which is basically here, I also then have to compute the maximum of the global. Obviously, complete, completing the computing of a maximum is these days really not so crucial. Um, this just stands for the fact that basically this is often overlooked, that in parallelization you have the idea of bringing this bigger piece together again, right? So, of course, obviously, if you want to have some let's say nice um, beach simulated or basically the whole uh, part of Europe may be simulated, whatever it is. It depends on the you know, coarse grained versus fine grained approaches that we discussed, how basically you crunch down then this domain depends of course on the availability of computing, but also the phenomena you maybe want to simulate. And what suggests it often is of course, having a blocky kind of domain decomposition. We will learn today that is loading for MPI to something we call the Cartesian communicator that is helping there. And then we can use the communicator nicely to basically do so-called shifts over this ocean in order to transfer data easier. But also there, once you have this, you have a kind of equal domain for everyone um, where we learned that also maybe not one processor gets just one tile in the domain. This could be a mapping from, you know, basically one to many, it depends really. Here you see we probably have around eight parts of the domain are taken by one processor. But this is not always this kind of idea that this is so simple. And <clears throat> this is something what we also have seen later then when we wanted to start with a real um, application. 
And this was basically encapsulated in two ideas. The first one was that we basically understood when I want to have this ocean waves or a boat on the ocean to simulate, we have certain time steps we would model in this. Because the physics at one point in time would be basically computing what now the water height is here, what are the, the, the height of the waves, the physical properties. And in the next steps, I would inform my neighbor tiles so that they can also then compute in the next time step the wave as it is moved forward in time. That was the same example like the heat in the room. If you remember, we would also do the same, the heat as it is now. And then with physics, I would collect, of course, my surroundings. So the heat obviously on the tiles next to you will influence also the heat that you have now. But we learned with this a very interesting other pass part now of this parallelization. And this was that I have to get the information for the next time step, which is T1 here in this example, in time step zero to compute it in time step one. Right? Again, think about what you see here, the arrows, look at them very precisely. They go basically into time and then form basically yet now into time so that this in the next time step from T0, all of this information from the neighbor tiles is there to compute the new heat. And in basically shared memory, you would say, when you have this all, let's say, crunched uh, into memory and it works, then this is not so much a difficult situation because you can access the properties as they are probably in these tiles because you have the idea of shared memory. We also learned, however, in earlier lectures that this is very limited, right? A domain, a large domain, like maybe here, a whole part of Europe or a bigger beach to simulate in a fine granularity hardly fits into shared memory of a node. So you probably would use different nodes to simulate this accurately. And with this, you have then the point of problem that sometimes maybe the next time step, if you go here, you would do the same, obviously, for each of these fellows of each of the different parts of your domain. But then you will quickly realize at some point in time, the domain ends because you have reached maybe the end of the node. A little bit what you see here, right? So that the domain is basically at the end of the particular, um, let's say, kind of node or CPU. And so in order to get to the data, we still need to compute basically the heat here, the heat that is on the other side, basically on what I cannot access. Hence, we introduce something we call ghost and halo layers that you see here, which are not really existing in this domain that you have here or here, right? So again, we crunch it down to a domain, we add certain ghost cells, just to enable that in time step zero, once I have computed everything in the current time step, I can inform the ghost cells and will put basically all the information and the data that I have on the other part of the tile into the space and memory and data part of the other processor so that in the time step one, when I do the step, I have now all the data from all the surrounding tiles. And this includes message exchanges as our name suggests with MPI, to really, before <clears throat> moving ahead in the iteration of the time, just inform all other processes and the ghost cells and hollow layers here, what's the situation. Now, we learned that basically often there's a very nice parallelization to it um, that you see here, or another example with the GPU computation where we said, this is beautiful to parallelize, right? Where we have the GPU um, can do this in very nicely, embarrassingly parallel, as you would say, uh, fashion only the color code it has to know each other in order to do the whole computation of the matrix vector multiplication here. But of course, when we come to other real problems, we quickly come into the problem of load balance, a uh, load imbalance. What you see here with the max global already that this one core has to do more is of course represented than also when you would do a just normal chunk cut that we have seen here basically and the blocky one, uh, every part is equal looks nice and shiny again. The The practice, however, unfortunately, life is not always like this. You see here a very interesting domain of data sciences where we want to cluster data for data items that are given to us from a data set. And you see very clearly that the part here is much more dense, much more computing needs to be happening here. While on the other side here, we see just a couple of data items. So much less computing. 
So what the solution can be is then that you don't cut the domain exactly like you would suggest like here, but you do some heuristics um, in terms of costs and then basically think a little bit of crunching even the domain, although you would say it looks very weird because no processor one has just this part, which looks not really nice and blocky, but still the idea is that the amount of computation is rather similar rather than you know having a beautiful domain decomposition then then would cause lots of imbalance because processor two would have almost nothing to do while processor one has all the work and this is reflected in many codes hence their performance optimization tools tunings available to make the code better there's whole teams whole workshops for a whole week that take these kind of codes the parallel codes and then look at them with tools in order to better their basically behavior to have a better domain decomposition maybe even or to also work with this load imbalance problems there were two metrics in the theory part which are very important and often misunderstood also when i think about back my assignments and um, exams the idea is here to talk about basically strong and weak scalability metrics and it's very important to understand that in strong scaling you do kind of a speed up by increasing the number of cores right that is important and the overall problem size remains the same obviously now when i when i come here on each of the different colors right when you see every colors there we have increased <clears throat> the work but for each of the ones that you have on this basically part here uh, of each of the colors the number of problems i want to solve with 16 64 256 cores etc remains the same so this is a strong scaling plot in order to get the relatively speed up and also to see the limits of codes often which you then basically see a little bit here with this kind of tail off right that you usually have you have always given in such plots the linear scaling that would be the theory of saying the more computing i put right with the number of cores I adding here and here we are already having 250,000 cores right so quite a lot and then I have also a quite nice relatively speed up but you see usually we, we observe that in the beginning codes are really um, close near optimal linear scaling but often they also then at some point in time will show this tail off and this is incorporated often uh, depending on the domain that you have uh, could be communication overheads um, that are usually also responsible especially given large core sizes when you want to do a very communication intensive codes um, and this is of course something where uh, we see also the limits of the application could be also certain serial parts um, as you basically allude a little bit to this um, in one way it could be also Amdahl's law interpretation that we had the last time that no matter how bad good you are in parallelization there was this parallelizable part of the application you're limited in the serial parts of it so if there's always a small serial part but you increase the more and more the course obviously the serial footprint gets also bigger but yeah that is something which of course comes more in real practical application but shows you that scaling just up to an exascale system with multi-millions of cores isn't just so simple and throwing just the applications to more and more cores breaking your problem into smaller smaller pieces even uh, might not be the best and doesn't work always the weak scaling is then another interpretation or another element you want to show as we say um, basically with the overall work to be staying constant in strong scaling here we don't do that in weak scaling we think rather give each core enough to do in other words you want to scale and show the scaling if we add more and more work but keeping the work basically per, co per core constant as, as best as possible, right? So that means we can maybe do more fine granular, better simulations the more I get in the number of cores, which is in a way also nice for us because if you think about what you see exactly here, the coarse grain simulation might be not helping us a lot in predicting the weather and predicting other phenomena that I want in this part of the domain. If I have a fine grained situation, I have to do much more basically computation per core. Uh, there's much more fine granular information, but it's maybe more useful, but eating up, of course, than much more number of cores. 
So this is really important to understand that basically in this weak scaling, you see it here a little bit, 14, uh, 140,000 particles per core and 10,000 particles per core. Um, because if you remember, this is here kind of this particle interaction, um, basically uh, code that we look in. There we basically want to see the efficiency and the runtime. And also there you see the more you basically do this, you keep the work constant per core, still there's a certain tail off at some point in time. But here we're already talking about almost half a million of cores, right? Think about what that means in a basically supercomputer. This is an older one called Ukraine. That's not so important, but the key message to take away is that at some point in time, again, communication overhead with all the many different cores will probably, um, you know, kick in a little bit here and many other limits that you would ha have here. And we had also that in this context, um, the law that we basically often refer to is Gustafsson law, which says even uh, the, the same I was alluding to, it's not the problem of just speed up, but we need bigger problems to do the parallelization then. In other words, do better simulations, more granularity, and so forth. So while lecture three was quite conceptual in the direction of um, basically uh, I thinking about how you can um, kind of bring a big problem into smaller pieces and compute on them, um, we basically would have taken this first before starting with MPI, but because of the assignments to give them out early to work on it already, we did a initial introduction to MPI already um, based on the students' feedback. But that's not a problem, but we left certain elements out of MPI in lecture two. And the idea of lecture four is now to complement this with a couple of things, which is MPI also good for that I couldn't capture in lecture two. Uh, needless to say, if you want to go to MPI, um, we have whole courses a whole week, right? So you easily could fill a complete lecture or course in the university just on MPI. Um, so here I, I pick different pieces in order to make certain points. What are important parts of the MPI communication idea? I'm thinking first about a little bit blocking, non-blocking MPI communication. Um, what are communicators again and what, how we can actually create our own subgroups. Not everything has to be MPI com world that we basically had already understood. And of course, we'll connect it a little bit to application motivations. Then uh, a little bit also the drawbacks or limitations when we could look on the hardware again, the hardware communication, the network is quite important in, don in that context as well but also stimulating more and more the idea why high performance computing really need the good interconnection between the cores, right? We have something like InfiniBand there, which means the cores really interact on a time step basis mostly, which we have learned is a kind of definition we have in applications in order to move forward in time. And <clears throat> there will be some interesting counterparts in the second part. Uh, where we'll talk then basically about more I.O. Because what we already only talked about was always communication exchanges. So MPI send receive, yet the MPI broadcast, collectives, all were directly communication between the data space of another processor, which we need because we know it's distributed memory computing. So I cannot access the memory of the other processor. So I have sent messages. What we left out a little bit would be then how I deal with files, right? A very important consideration. If you're very large scale simulation, you want to drop the status to file of the weather prediction as we learned in one of the earlier lectures with the NWP, the numerical weather prediction, for example, you don't wanna be limited again in serial IO that would be causing load imbalance again and more of these tail offs I just described, right? From the speed off. So here we want to have also parallel IO techniques. I will show you uh, a couple of terminologies first before we then Go to some concrete examples here and there, how you use now MPI techniques. There's a certain parallel I.O., um, I would say de facto standard um, yeah, tool set with HDF5 and NetCDF and so on. We will look again also in the light of making basically your application portable. So a kind of short roundabout of MPI, as I said. So this can in no way cover completely MPI programming because you also know in lecture five, we already move forward to shared memory programming, OpenMP, which is often combined then with MPI to do hybrid codes. But uh, it's something you need to, of course, to further study in the future when you work in this field.
but it shows you at least one of the major parts of MPI that we left out a little bit in lecture two. So let's go with some of the advanced techniques in order to make it really for you understandable uh, what are the complexer aspects of the power programming. More complex in the sense that it's not only now just beautiful message exchanges, send, receive, broadcast, gather, scatters. Here we talk about really more understanding now the domain decomposition in context, right? So why would I even bother to do a broadcast to all other processes? Um, why I want to have a mechanism like a Cartesian communicator that makes it easy for me as programmer to communicate to every other processor in a very systematic way. Let's say a boat over the ocean, right? So from one tile to another, the boat will move. I want to calculate the position based on the wave height, based on many other factors in physics, uh, according to the boat, perhaps. So this is something which is not obvious. And of course, there you need at least an idea that the way how you communicate the data uh, should be right straightforward. And you can imagine if you have then suddenly three boats to manage and they maybe want to catch fish and the fish populations might be also simulated, it becomes quickly more and more complex. But these are nice abstractions again on, on different levels where you will see that MPI offers fantastic um, routines really to abstract from the network level again. So you could map a Cartesian communicator on the network and you as a programmer only deal with the Cartesian and shifts instead of really do again send receives message exchanges on the very lower level um, with network protocols and so on. So <clears throat> quite neat technique. Um, which makes probably also MPI so successful, right? The way how you handle this is basically very similar as we have heard before, but now we introduce a little bit more the idea of domain decompositions. And by knowing what you learned today, um, you basically can definitively already start engaging in some of the parallel applications that are out there in the world, which we have seen a little bit here in all these different application parts. So let's come to some advanced MPI techniques. Just a short recap um, from MPI itself, just to refresh our memories. We're doing this because it's, a diff it's a basically a distributed memory computer approach of programming. In other words, every processor basically has its own memory and a network interface, and I use this network interface in order to send and receive messages. I say a broadcast from one processor will reach every other processor in this communication network um, that are specified with a communicator. And in a way, it looks a little bit like this. Obviously, that's a bit like um, single tuned, but you can see that it's a send and receive, for instance, as an example, perhaps. But um, of course, it's much more elaborate than this. And that is what we want to look today. And the one thing I wanted to start with also maybe showing you a little bit um, already some elements again of load imbalancing, right? So where comes this waiting time, which causes sometimes um, load balancing issues? Um, you see here the difference between blocking and non-blocking MPI communication. And this is not obvious to you. We will see how that materializes. So <clears throat> this is the one that you have already learned in the lectures, the MPI send and the MPI receive. And these are the two live, um, remote live parts of the different processors we have. So here are two basically that evolve over time, as we know, and all have their own lifetime. Now, when one starts the MPI send far later than the other processor is starting the MPI receive, you could imagine that in a way we have this long waiting time, which means the processor is doing nothing, right? It's blocked by moving into this operation MPI receive, is waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, nothing happens. And then suddenly the other processor says, hey, now I'm ready to send, right? In other words, someone is ready to get your ping but no ping comes. And then ping comes at some point in time, and then it's good because I'm ready for the ping, but I wasted a lot of time here for waiting. And these are the elements alluding to load imbalance and standing a little bit for this orange here, what you see in all of these different areas. But this was only one part of communication option. Um, what I didn't told you before and what is possible is that basically you could do something you see here. You do have an MPI send still as this operation, but you can do from the other processor if you know that it's a bit uncertain when basically the other processor will send the MPI send, 
there's a possibility to do this non-blocking I receive here, right? So this means um, that here you can, um, you know, enable more overlaps between this um, computation and communication. Here would you be blocked only to communicate. There's no computation, just waiting time. And the MPI I receive means here I can do maybe a lot of things afterwards. And then basically I would say now it's really time to get the MPI send. And for this, I would do also a certain MPI wait construct in order to now really synchronize between the different processors, which we also didn't have before. Of course, there must be a way, to, for instance, if you want to have now the new time interval, maybe of a parallel simulation where all the different physics parameters will be exchanged again, for example, then you better wait, right? It's not that you didn't really receive anything yet and you already compute in one core the next time zone, but the other one is still, you know, waiting for send. It will be a big mess. Hence, there need be some barriers, some weights for certain aspects to synchronize elements of the communication. And this is now new, the non-blocking MPI communication sounds trivial, but I have to say the more you program in that and the bigger your application is, the more complex it becomes again, right? You see here other examples of non-blocking communication. Um, I could do the same reverse. I say I have an MPI receive. Um, that is now blocked and I say, okay, I just wait. But um, in order to see when we basically can can answer this, I could do an I send, uh, which means on this non-blocking send at some point in time, just continue what I'm doing and then send. A, I have to do the synchronization step again with MPI wait later. But here again, it shows also for this processor, this would be some waiting time. And obviously I can combine both I can combine the non, you know, blocking I send with the non blocking I receive. Still, both basically have to do this wait statement where you then want to synchronize and see what is now essentially then the, the, the kind of waiting time or the use time, which is not so good. And there are different paradigms. You would say wait is basically is waiting for a very specific MPI request to complete, while wait all is basically given for a very chunk of MPI requests to complete. It's already more advanced programming, um, but this is something where it's much more realistic to think that way sometimes, right? Because not every core is doing always completely the same in terms of computing. Think about some is computing the water, but someone is computing the water with fish inside and also with a boat crossing it to hunt the fish. So much more physics to compute and with this much more computing before maybe message exchange can start it. And this is much more realistic. Now we talked about um, bringing this in different groups the last time. And also here, I don't want to repeat again what I had several times with the MPI com world. By now you should be, you know, knowing that this is all the world of all processes, but I can group my own ones in order to do different communications. The example here was maybe one group of the processors would be responsible for the boat crossing the ocean, while the other group of processors might be responsible to compute the wave propagation over the ocean. Different types of physics, obviously interacting every now and then with each other, but still um, basically one way to do the computing and to do parallel computing on a certain problem. And the way how that works here in order to crunch down this MPI COM world now into different communicators is MPI COM split uh, that you see here quite nice. And also what is important is that each of the communicators would have new identities of ranks, right? While in the MPI COM world, which might be the left side here, uh, you have just one rank zero, obviously, right? Because everybody's unique. You have now different new ranks if you split the communicators or do new different communicators. It's very important to realize. Once you don't need them anymore, it's wise to free them. MPI com free is, can be used for that. An example, very here's shortly in source code, you see again MPI com world from world size and world rank things we already discussed many times. Um, and the example here, I can divide it by four colors that you see here. Um, and you now when we have the 16 uh, elements here, I would do an MPI com split. Um, obviously, I need to transfer the MPI com world. So saying which communicator I want to split, I want to say it should be basically on, on four. And then I get basically this row communicators back that I need then to communicate. And here you can see in row rank row size, which is different now from the normal world size and world rank, 
which we basically give out here as an example in the printf statement, where you see then when you execute this, for example, as an example here, world rank, world size, and row rank, row size are all different, basically alluding a little bit to the visualization and then you would to free the communicator. Obviously, then you would compute on these communicators. You would to have message exchanges. You would use it, not just free it again. It's a bit of a toy example, just to see how you work with this com split. So it's quite nice to do that. But when you want to have a more systematic way um, to really enable communication, let's say, as we have here, when we say now the boat moves over the ocean, you see that it could be basically going to this direction or the boat goes to that direction over a so-called Cartesian grid. And this is something which is specially supported in MPI. There's a Cartesian communicator that we can create with MPI card create. And it has a couple of um, paradigm uh, parameters. The dimensions, of course, how big should be that, um, the period of the uh, array. And basically, if we should really then also reorder the ranks in the output of the communicator. You see that mostly um, because basically you see many simulations have this backwards and forward structure. Is it fish swimming over the ocean? Is the wind, the wave propagation over the ocean? Is a boat floating over the ocean? No matter what you want to simulate, in one respect, there's always a systematic behavior that you basically see. Again, the dimensions here as the parameter for the Cartesian. Here we have a three times four grid. We see the rank of each of them, basically 0 to 11. And um, then the row and column, according to the Cartesian grid world. And then basically, when you see you want to do a message exchange, um, you, know, you need to have the source and destination. Basically, if you want to do an MPI send receive, for instance, or basically give an update to a specific processor. But how do you know what would be essentially this rank, basically, that you have just below you, right? Hence, here comes the Cartesian structure beautifully. It will give you the information you need in order to perform the send receive by doing so-called shifts, right? And with this, you are able, like this figure suggests, in one time step, you're here. And basically, now you prepare in order for the next time step for this iteration here, a communication along these tiles to basically go, let's say, one ahead, one step in this direction. Um, which then could simulate this time step and to propagate this information now over this Cartesian grid is something where you can use beautifully this Cartesian communicator. So how that would work is basically, obviously, we have to define the dimensions. We have to see if it's periodic. That refers to this loop that you see here. So what happens if you end here in the grid? Usually the simulation would start again. In other words, when you send here from the source of basically um, this particular fellow, the destination would be zero here. If the source um, would be essentially here, the four, and we will send to a, to zero um, as a rank here. And this is the idea of um, basically this periodic element. It doesn't have to be. It could be also not defined when you end it in order to understand that you reach the end of a simulation domain. You get here the coordination, the, the coordinations ranks, um, basically the 2D communicator that you have to define. You specify if you want to reorder the periods and the dimensions. And then you have this coordinates <clears throat> that you can fill. And the beauty is now that you get with a shift in one specific direction, like for instance here, um, the information for the source and destination that you see basically in the lowest part here. But take away the message that this is not communicating yet, right? So the real communication is, of course, then taking care when you do, for instance, an MPI send receive, like here, an interesting operation that combines the send receive in one operation here, and then would basically give you the source and destination that you obtained from this Cartesian communicator in order to let fish or the boat swim in one direction. Obviously, that doesn't work only in one direction. You can put it in different directions, um, which is important then and would be more elaborate examples. Just some considerations on the network level, you actually abstract, abstract from this. Um, we have learned for these interactions, this is a quite important part here, the InfiniBand connection in HPC. Um, we can still use different network topologies underneath, basically that you would have, but still, um, if you have a good parallelization behavior, you need really a good interconnect between the nodes uh, that you have seen there. And by this, 
you basically can, um, you know, have some other elements that we have to talk about in, in MPI, where basically the ranks could have, again, some load imbalance because you work on different problems. You see that here simulated on the sleep 10 and store results to file. So someone has maybe also an IO, um, you know, big bottleneck or something like this. So this means they might have different behavior. And what we can enable basically is that um, before I maybe do a bigger loop here in this application, it's not shown here, but it would be one example. I let everyone to finish an MPI barriers, right? So it blocks basically um, everything until basically all processors in the communicator in MPI com world have reached this, which is a synchronization, a collective operation, more or less. And of course, can also cause in this sense, a lot of load imbalance because some ranks might be directly coming to the barrier while other ranks like here, F rank zero and rank one, maybe spend a lot of time first and then the others would be just running idle. And this is something to avoid, of course, if you have a large HPC application. Other factors that could basically influence this behavior um, and optimization that is possible are then hardware elements like the network, by the IO we will touch a little bit later, but of course network is a bit related to this as well, where of course the communication then refers on different factors. So what type of communication do I have there? Network topologies of a torus or a fat tree, uh, where the communication paradigm has different switches on different levels. So all of this is affecting also the performance the more you go higher and was also partly responsible for some of these tail offs you have seen. The more uh, cores you basically use, uh, the more it, of course, in also affects this communication. Then um, how that looks like in basically different abstraction layers, you see a little bit like here, the real physical level, you have compute nodes and you have, for instance, real file servers, and you would have InfiniBand between this, some switches, and uh, basically I.O. nodes maybe in some of the different systems you see that here that are very specially dedicated for I.O. problems, for instance. But you see also in order to drop, for instance, the results from one core, it needs to use the connections to get to this network, you know, I.O. Uh, core or network part and then drops it to file. In other words, you affect the performance of the interactions here already by just moving basically towards the I.O. node and then the INO node goes there. So it's kind of cross traffic, what I mean, right? With multiple IO streams, it gets even more. Contention can be reached. Another problem that you have, for instance, alluding already to our definition of I parallel IO later, why we need this, but also necessary limits that we have in the interconnects and the amount of switches I have. And you can imagine that, of course, these switches are expensive. The InfiniBand network connection is very expensive as well. You would say even today, compute cores are cheap, but what is really expensive are not only the accelerators, but the good connection between the cores. Hence, you have these different switches, which cost a lot of money, and that's why people have invented different ideas how you basically have this switch realized. You see here, nothing else than an in and out connected via this switch connection. And uh, there are different paradigms um, what you would do. You would here say it's a four port non-blocking switch because everybody is beautifully connected to every other one. Um, but you see also a little bit here, the fat tree um, network with a full bandwidth, um, which would be now very, very expensive, right? So that we have switches. Um, and of course, that means also you have this redundant connections that can be used and everybody is very nicely connected. Um, uh, to every other one of the switch and then here the compute cores. But um, of course the cores now enjoy this full bandwidth, right? In order to communicate with this fellow here, I can just go to this one. It will have an immediate connection to the other. How it looks like much more these days is rather something like this, um, where you have, for instance, uh, newer ideas, how you do this different ideas of trees combined with so-called dragonfly topologies so um, this is something where um, also lots of communication and impacts are there, especially if you move towards exascale, right? The more we have now with these different communicators um, and the bigger I want to use communicators in larger systems, more and more cores are added, more and more of these leaves if you want, then you're getting more and more in this communication overhead. 
But then also chances are that not every core every time needs to communicate with the other core here on the complete other side. Hence, there are topologies like the dragonfly, which has some local or regional part. And you see here also a little bit how people save a little bit money, where it is a one to three oversubscription, right? You have three, six connections. This is not anymore this full fat tree that we have seen, but still it's still enabling us, of course, with a good connection here, but it's not the full performance, um, which basically brings us to some cost savings in a very, very large systems. And here's the, guy, the idea of the dragonfly uh, topology, where a little bit can allude to this would alone uh, be to basically present that in very detail would take probably a whole lecture to go through. And I think in this particular course, based on applications and so on, it's not worth doing it. But you see a little bit the idea of this intergroup topology, um, which is basically one part of this dragonfly. Obviously, you have to basically fine tune that to the given system at hand. But it shows that it's a quite, um, let's say, popular way how to do it. Um, there are different network parts um, that I would just give you as short examples, uh, like here the torus, for instance. Every one is again in different um, dimensions connected. Could be even a 3D torus, for instance. Um, but this is very good for next neighbor communication, obviously. Um, that is quite nice. But the reality these days is rather something like this. Again, you see here the the dragonfly plus regional uh, topology with certain cells that are very good connected and then connected on the overall layer. Within, let's say, um, the booster model, and then even you have to see that this booster is connected to the cluster module even with another high bandwidth performance. How that now looks from the hardware side, um, obviously, if you take just one node of, out of this Juvels booster with an A100 card from NVIDIA, for instance, here you see um, each of the A100 cards, so four per node and they would be connected to a switch which then has this connection um, to the one hand, of course, to the um, uh, to the memory, but of course, to the other hand, also then to the network interconnect where this information is then sent and received, so to speak, through this topology, if you want. And then here, the InfiniBand really offers you a very, very nice um, uh, bandwidth. Of course, on the other hand, we've seen when the right switch system is a way uh, is there or the right switch up setup is there, you can save a lot of cost because this means also lots of cost to have all the infiniband connections or basically also the very costly um, switches. Hence, a very interesting topic. Um, we could talk about this much more. I just wanted to close the first part a little bit on the uh, trouble or the problem of communication optimization by task core mappings, which would be now the very detailed analysis where is now really one task and how the core related that you basically get from the schedule is then able to do this um, and basically is reflecting the topology. There you can, of course, imagine that tasks that often communicate to each other should be somehow closely located to go not through the whole cluster in communication. Hence, this is a very active research question. Um, you basically see optimized task core mappings enable basically around one to three performance, but it could be quite a big thing in a real big application, so even more. However, you have to say, um, to really map this effectively, here's an example on a heat map, um, in the, which we basically did um, to really do this uh, and have this perfectly tuned takes a lot of time. This was a complete master thesis RV year, uh, just to understand in a heat map how we can do this. And then it depends obviously on which systems you use, how the topology is in the network all of different characteristics, but it is possible to optimize it. But uh, chances are that this takes a lot of time and then gives you just one or 2% performance, which could be making a big difference, but still maybe you also have to uh, check the time you invest in this. So to understand this a little bit more, I think InfiniBand and the interconnect to understand this is a crucial element of a HPC course. Hence, I would like encourage you to also look in this video here and then we will continue in 10 minutes to talk more about the IO techniques in that context.